Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Overwatch University. My name is Susanna Song. I am the Director of Marketing and Communications at Highwire Networks. And if you don't know already, Overwatch by Highwire Networks is a sponsor of Overwatch University. And Overwatch is Highwire's managed sec uh, security services offering. So if you don't know much about it, please check us out. Um, but without further ado, let me introduce you to today's course. Uh, it is actually our final course of the fall series. It's called Cybersecurity Marketing Simplified. And our speaker today is Callie Henderson. And Callie uh, not only is a founder and uh, senior partner at Buzz Theory, she's also Highwire's marketing consultant. We go to her for everything, for strategy, just give it to deliverables, and she is awesome. She is my partner, um, does amazing work for us, and we are truly uh, thankful and um, just ecstatic to have her on our team. And so we wanted to share her knowledge and her expertise with all of you because you guys are part of our community. We want to see you succeed as well. So to give you a little, just kind of background, a little bit about her resume, let me share that with you right now. You can also see it on your screen. She has 30 plus years um, of experience in tech communications and marketing. Uh, she's a Forrester top five channel marketing expert a Forbes Council member, CompTIA Emerging Tech Council member. She's on the board of Cloud Girls, also a past board member of Alliance of Channel Women. Uh, she's a Mission Sisters who works um, on the advisory board, and she is a former editor-in-chief of Channel Partners. So Callie, thank you so much for being with us this morning. You are a busy lady, and we are privileged to have you with us. Thanks so much, Susanna. I appreciate the invitation and I'm glad to be here to talk with um, your partners and um, MSPs in the community that are looking at uh, marketing cybersecurity. So let's uh, get right into it. We're going to talk about what is marketing. Um, we're going to talk about getting started and then as promised in the teaser we're going to talk about some best practices i also will keep in mind that we're going to be looking at this from the standpoint of if you don't already have a marketing department or a big marketing budget so we'll try to um, talk about some hacks and and things like that along the way um, the first thing is, what is marketing? Uh, we're starting off with this question because maybe you already know what marketing is, or maybe you think you know, but if you're like me and you started working in tech when uh, we were still just using fax machines, it's entirely possible that your view of what marketing is might be dated. It's not arts and crafts, and it's not even Mad Men. So, um, we're gonna level set and um, we're gonna begin with some highlights from the first two speakers that were part of this training series on um, selling and marketing cybersecurity. So what is marketing? Marketing is critical. Chris Weiser, who did the first session in uh, this training series said, sales and marketing are like oxygen for your business. So those are some wise words from Chris Weiser. I had to do it. Those of you who know me, I love puns. So um, Chris actually um, is someone that you probably know, but if you don't, he grew and sold an MSP and he now teaches MSPs how to grow their businesses. Uh, he was a tech guy, so I want to make that clear. And that's maybe a lot like some of you, but he says that his best success came when his MSP became a sales and marketing company that sold IT services. So not an IT services company, a sales and marketing company that sold IT services. So it's, a, it's kind of a subtle distinction, but it's an important one. And it only stands to reason because a lot of the problems that you might be having um, needy clients, unskilled help, 80 hour work weeks, are solved by improving your cash flow, which is what sales and marketing is all about. So, 
Well, marketing also is about telling your stories. Highwire CEO Mark Porter talked about this in session two. So as an MSSP, your story is that cybersecurity is not a technology problem, it's a business problem. So let's walk through that really quickly. A breach causes downtime, it causes data loss, it causes revenue loss, reputation loss. Those are all business problems. There is a solution, but it's not necessarily an easy one. There are 1,200 point solutions that you can look at for um, security. Which one are you supposed to choose? Oh, and guess what? Once you get it, you need to monitor it 24 seven because the threats change all the time. And who's gonna do that monitoring? There's a shortage of security experts. So this is a huge business challenge. Um, oh, I forgot something else too. Getting all of that is quite expensive if you're sourcing it yourself. So the answer then is you probably need to outsource to somebody who can do it better, faster, cheaper, which is um, part of your story. Um, marketing is also about educating the customer. Mark said that education starts with sales, but since he's a huge advocate for marketing, I don't think he'll mind if I amend that statement to say that education begins with sales and marketing. You've probably heard um, you know, that buyers are self-educating online, that you know, by the time they get to you, 70% of the decision is already completed. That's true. And, you know, if you think about it, this is the same thing that you're doing when you're shopping. You're thinking, oh, you know what, I have this problem. Who can help me fix that? Um, your customers are doing the same thing. They need an expert. And so you need to get them to come to you. Um, the graphic on the right, I like this one um, because it kind of talks about marketing as a fishing expedition, wherein the more that you educate your buyer, the easier it is to catch them. So you might start doing some education for those that, um, that don't really realize they have a problem and they um, don't have a lot of knowledge. Um, those are the ones you need to spend more time with. But as you move up, you get into people who actually have a, a high motivation to buy because they have a big problem, but they don't know much. Those are kind of a sweet spot. And then the last one is those that are highly motivated and you've educated, and those are the ones that are going to buy. So uh, that's a great way to think about it. So uh, marketing also is demonstrating outcomes. So you have got to demonstrate value. Um, before you can hand somebody your red sheet. <laughs> Please don't do that. Uh, you aren't marketing technology or tools. You're marketing data protection. You're marketing risk management. Um, ultimately, you're marketing peace of mind. Marketing also is about building trust. This is true in general. It's especially true with cybersecurity. I mean, how do you get someone uh, to trust you to handle their security when, as we mentioned, the stakes are so high? Revenue loss, reputation loss. I mean, it's, it's a very critical job. Um, building trust is very important. And, you know, if you think about it, businesses that are shopping really have no idea the difference between MSPs, between you and someone else. So you've got to explain that and you've got to give them reasons to trust you. So um, how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna talk about how marketing is creating and leveraging influence. And there's several aspects to influencing people, six according to Robert Cialdini, who's one of the experts on influencing uh, people. So uh, I like this because it gives you kind of a really quick checklist of things that you can do to create influence and this is what you need to be doing. So if you wanna create trust, one of the best ways is to project authority and credibility in your space. In this case, your space is cybersecurity. So one of the ways you do that is you create authoritative content on cybersecurity. You 
speak at cybersecurity events, you get quoted in press, you apply for and hopefully win awards. Now, some of you may be thinking, I don't really know how to do this. Some of these things are what we call earned media, which requires a little bit of effort. It requires a third party, but you have a lot of owned media, your website, your social channels, um, maybe your podcasts, different, different things like that, that you have complete control over and you can produce content for those. And those, um, you know, that's not requiring anyone else to help you do that. Another thing you want to do is um, go a step further and get some social proof that you are an authority. So one of the things um, that you can do is look to your customers, get testimonials from them, um, maybe showcase case studies for some of the successes that you've had for your customers. And that is one of the best ways. Um, I didn't put it in the stack, but one of the things that, um, that uh, Tech Target, which is a big publication you might um, uh, be familiar with in the tech space, they had it put out a chart that showed every part of the buying cycle case studies and testimonials are good so um, from the beginning down to the decision you can use case studies and testimonials to help you move your um, prospects towards buying um, number three is likability and um, <laughs> this one is a little a little tough to talk about but you probably heard that people buy from people they like and that sometimes includes even the way they look so if you translate that to a digital marketing presence it's really about your website your website is your company and it needs to look good <laughs> and more importantly for a cybersecurity salesman it needs to be secure if they go to your website and it's super old and it's not secure they're definitely not choosing you as your cybersecurity provider so um you need to really think about that um and we'll talk a little bit more about your website and investing in your website in a minute in a minute but i'm going to jam through the rest of these they're important ones but i know that we only have a little bit of time with you today so reciprocity is a great thing that marketers use all the time that you should be thinking about and that is offering information to get something from your customer, particularly a contact information, maybe it's a meeting. So one of the things you need to think about here is if you're holding tight to your knowledge because you think it's your secret sauce, and I know some of you do because um, you know, you're entrepreneurs and you think you do something um, really special, if you're holding on to that, um, you know, that's not the way to be thinking about marketing. Even if you tell somebody what it is, they cannot replicate it, or very few people can. So giving your information is a way for them to come back to you. Another thing is consistency. So you know, this is probably not what you think it is. It's basically asking for small commitments. So if you, if you ask for the email, they give you the email, and then you ask for the phone number, they're like, I already gave you my email, I'll give you my phone number too. It makes it easier, it's incremental. And then eventually you're gonna get to a meeting or a demo, you know, maybe it's a 10 minute call, and that turns into a 30 minute call, turns into the demo, turns into you know proposal. Asking for these small commitments is a way that you can influence people. And then the last one is scarcity and fear. And, and I know that it's controversial to be talking about um, selling based on fear. Some people don't like that, but the truth of the matter is that um, we are more motivated to do something by the fear of losing something than by gaining an opportunity. And in the cybersecurity space, uh, the threat of loss um, that we talked about, revenue, reputation, data, is actually a motivating factor. All right, so with that, marketing is constant. And I know this isn't great news for a lot of you but the job is never done <laughs> and um, if you were taught that the buyer's journey is like a, a funnel um, it's more like a cycle actually and uh, marketing doesn't simply hand off leads to sales they are marketing throughout the life cycle of the customer so they're attracting potential customers educating and engaging them until they become customers 
but it doesn't even stop there. Then you're marketing the, to them to maybe buy more services or renew their term with you, or more importantly, probably is to become advocates for you. They're the ones giving you the testimonials, the ones that are going to do the case study with you, the one that's going to write the good review online. So you're continually um, trying to market to them and create fans. So it's kind of like the circle, circle of life and you've got to feed it, right? So now we're going to get to work. Um, I'm going to go over a few things that you need to do first, and then we're going to get into those, some of those best practices and hacks. Um, first thing you need to do is articulate your unique value proposition. And if you haven't done this work, literally writing this down in succinct terms, you need to take the time to do it. Because if you don't know how to explain your value, how is somebody else going to understand it? So I know it sounds basic, but you really need to take the time to do this. The next, um, oh, here's a great example. I forgot I put this in here. Um, Overwatch's uh, value proposition is cybersecurity simplified. It also happens to be their tagline, but it doesn't have to be that way for you. Um, they, um, you know, manage to make it work. But here's how they back it up. They talk about all the issues that are the challenges in um, cybersecurity. So too many siloed solutions, constantly evolving threats, rising regulatory mandates, alert overload, um, a very expensive um, cost. And then they answer those. They offer complete security, 24 by seven operation, continuous compliance, targeted response using AI and machine learning, affordability, they change the model. It's a subscription-based service that requires no capital outlay. This is their value proposition. And as their partner, it's also your value proposition. So they've done some of the work for you if you end up working with them. Um, but this is an exercise that you need to do for your company. On top of this, even if you are working with Highwire, you'll have some of your own things that you do differently that also are unique. And you need to make sure you know what those are. Um, then you want to identify your ideal customer profile. What businesses are you targeting? And if your answer is all businesses, anybody with money, then you actually don't know who you're targeting. <laughs> you you want to do this exercise. Take a look at your best, and by best, I mean most profitable customers, and see what traits they have in common. Then you begin can begin to market to companies that are similar to them. You want to, um, here are some of the questions you want to ask. I'm kind of going to skip over some of this and you can get the slides later, but uh, from Susanna. But, um, you know, you want to identify who they are in some level of specificity. And then you also need to look at who is the buyer inside of that company. Um, and I will tell you that you might have more than one. Lots of the buying decisions today are made by several stakeholders and with cybersecurity, you're likely to have at least an IT decision maker and a business decision maker. Remember we talked about earlier that cybersecurity is a business problem. So you're not going to be able to rely just on talking to your IT contact, which is maybe how you've been doing things heretofore. So um, you're going to have to understand who the buyer, the business decision maker is and what makes them tick and what their role is in the decision making um, process. Okay, uh, make an investment. So part of the teaser for the session was how to market without a budget. And um, unfortunately, I'm gonna tell you it's not possible. Even if you do no paid promotions, you add no staff and are doing everything yourself, you've still got to allocate parts of your salary and you've got some tools that you need to have um, that you're gonna have to budget for. So it's important to remember that what Chris said, marketing is oxygen for your business. So it's like breathing. Marketing is necessary. It's an investment in a healthier business that you can 
um, that you can grow and a marketing, I'm excuse me, that you can grow and then you'll have more money <laughs> to invest over time. So um, a good way for you to look at what should you budget is a percentage of revenues and looking at B2B services firms. It's about 12% right now. This number is actually high because of the COVID situation. Um, and the numbers are a little off and the reason is because some revenues are coming down when you're looking at averages. So I put in here the trend line so that you can see some more typical numbers. Um, the trend line does aggregate B2B and B2C. B2C companies typically spend more, um, particularly if you're uh, in the smaller business size. Um, the B2Cs are definitely going to be spending more than you. But in 2018, it was about 7% for B2B companies. So, you know, if you're thinking somewhere around, you know, between 7 and 10%, that might be a good uh, starting place. Um, your goal, obviously, is for marketing to be self-funding. I mean, you don't want it to be a, a cost center. <laughs> That's not the goal. But at first, it might feel like a cost center because you're gonna to have to make some initial investments. But you can ramp up your budget as you start and you achieve more successes. Uh, make a plan. So I really wanna say just do it, just get started. And, um, and really that's better than doing nothing. But I would recommend that you have a plan. And it doesn't need to be a big, giant, huge marketing plan, but you need to have some direction. So. It can be as simple as articulating a goal or goals and how you might achieve them. What strategy are you going to use? And then uh, what tactics are you going to use? So the actions that you're going to take to execute on those strategies. So let me give you an example. Um, your objective is to increase leads by a certain percentage. So how are you going to do that? Um, one way is you're going to try to increase web visitors by a certain percentage. Um, another way is you're going to try to boost form fills by X percentage. Again, form fills are going to be getting you new names. Um, so how are we going to accomplish either of those? Well, um, to increase web visitors, you might want to do Google AdWords and uh, bring people to your site, and that's a paid strategy. Or you might want to use uh, earned media strategy by posting links on your social media content. That only works though if you're if you have followers. So if you don't, you might also have to do paid social. Um, and you want to boost form fills. You are going to um, perhaps offer a free ebook on the landing page from the Google AdWords um, campaign. Um, or another tactic you might do is when somebody's on your website, you have a pop-up ad when they ask, exit before they go that offers them something. Maybe it's um, please subscribe to our newsletter or maybe it's that same ebook that you're promoting. So um, uh, those are just some of the things that you could do. And you'll notice that all the goals have some kind of a number on them, a percentage. Um, I recommend that you do this because this is how you're going to measure success. And um, it isn't we can talk about how you would figure out those percentages and if you want to talk to me about that separately we can discuss that but the gist of it is make a goal and make progress towards that goal and if you need to change the goal and make it more that's awesome because that means you're having success so um so anyway you just need to make sure that you are measuring all right choose your channels so the reason i put this up uh, was because in the conversation that Susanna had with Chris Weiser, um, one of the people that was um, on the call, uh, one of the attendees, was talking about some of the tactics that she was using. And Chris said, well, you know, some of those things um, I was doing 10 years ago, and maybe you need to refresh what you're doing. And right now, it's really important to be asking yourself this question because some of the channels that maybe you might think to use um, aren't available to you now, like live events. We're just not doing those. And I know that a lot of people, especially in tech, relied on trade shows to get their leads. You know, chamber meetings, um, some of the bigger events, the big tech events, 
you know, and, and, you know, a lot of my clients are the same. That was one of their big lead, lead generating places, but they're gone for a while and we don't know exactly when they're going to come back. Maybe they'll only come back in, in a small way, but right now digital first is the way to go. Um, the other thing you might want to think about though, is that some of these traditional methods actually still work. So referrals, referral marketing works always. So you need to be thinking about that. Press, this is a huge overlooked marketing opportunity for you. And particularly I wanted to bring it up because if you subscribe to a press distribution service, it is one of the cheapest ways to advertise and get um, SEO um, backlinks. So, which is something that you need to get in order to increase your domain authority for your website. And I know that's a little in the weeds, but just trust me, it's a, it's something that you can think about doing. And it's one of the cheaper methods of getting exposure. Um, you can still obviously telemarket. Hopefully you're still doing that. And um, I've even uh, heard some people still doing dire some direct mail but they're doing it in concert with some of these other methods that are um, more digital. Um, build your toolkit. Okay, so as part of your marketing investment, you're gonna need some basic tools. Um, as we've discussed, your website is all important, especially in a digital first world. You need it to look modern. And um, if your website is dated and some of your websites are dated, I'm sure you really need to fix that. Um, typically, all the marketing efforts that you're doing lead back to your website, um, so it's critical. It's like the hub. I know there are some newer marketing techniques like um, in social downloads and things like that that don't, but by and large, the things that you're going to be doing probably will lead you back to the website, so you need to make sure it's good. You also need to get um, an email service provider like MailChimp or Constant Contact. Um, and a marketing automation system would be nice. MailChimp has some limited availability. HubSpot has better. Um, you need to set up your social channels. I guess I skipped those. And um, you'll probably want to tie any of your CRMs, I mean, your uh, marketing automation to your CRM. You're probably using one or a PSA system of some sort to manage your customers. You also need Google Analytics on your site. A couple newer things you can try, text-based marketing um, and chatbots. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about those. I would put them as optional, but I think they're things that you might wanna think about. Um, uh, one of the things I did wanna mention about this list is that a lot of these things are free or low cost. So social channels, free to set up. Uh, email accounts. There are free accounts and there are very low cost subscriptions. MailChimp is very economical. Marketing automation, uh, HubSpot has free accounts. Um, so some of these things are not expensive to get started, but you do have to do a little bit of training to figure out how to work them or, um, you know, get somebody to help you who already knows. So um, allocate the work. <laughs> Who's going to do all this work? So if your investment is mostly sweat, then you need to make sure you talk to your partners like Highwire about what resources they have for you to utilize. So Highwire, for example, offers a partner portal with brandable materials and email cadences, things like that, that they're already created for you and you can use them to reach your customers. Um, if you're not taking advantage of these kinds of things, that's a mistake, you need to be using them. Um, then you need to figure out what you're going to do in house. And is that going to be you personally, or do you have people on your staff that can help you with this? Do you really need to hire somebody? Um, or will you outsource to a freelance or an agency? So these are all decisions that you need to be thinking about. Um, and you can kind of change your strategy over time, by the way. So if you're going to fill the gaps, in your organization, you can go to a full service agency, which is like what I do. And it's not like what you might um, call a virtual CIO that you probably offer. It's a fractional marketing department. So if you can't afford to hire all the experts that you need, a digital marketing person, a creative person, a social media marketer, a content person, um, a video person, 
then you can rent out ours or, or another agency. Um, there are also agencies that are more specialized. So they might just do paper click or they might just do PR. And so, you know, if there's an area where you're just really needing particular help and you don't have the expertise, you might consider somebody like that. Um, another option is freelance. These are specialists in certain areas. Um, they can execute for you, which is great, but you're going to have to really manage the work product, coordinating it, um, which is fine, but it is extra work and you need to figure that in. Do you have time to do that? Do you have somebody on your staff that can do that? Uh, marketplaces are a great place to find these people. Fiverr is a good one. Writer's Access is another good one. Um, I put this last one, virtual assistants, on the list because Chris mentioned it in his presentation, which isn't something I had actually thought about, but um, they certainly could carry out various tax, tasks at your direction. So some social media posting, loading emails, um, maybe helping you write or post blogs, things like that. Um, the thing I would caution you about with some of this stuff is that um, if you're dealing with content, you really are gonna have to have a hand in it to some extent, because um, unless you find somebody who is a security expert, you're going to have to actually um, do some of the work. And that's why I would say, Leverage your vendor partner like Highwire because they have those experts. They already are creating a lot of that those resources. So um, outsourcing the content is is tougher unless you get somebody who's got domain expertise. Um, some of the other things, though, you definitely can outsource to um, other people. Um, measure success. So you can look at ROI in a few ways based on the activity the marketing activity and the initial sale. Or if you're in an MRR business like you guys are, it's better to look at customer lifetime value. Um, and I've given you the formulas here. And if you're just getting started and this looks a little overwhelming and you don't feel like doing this math, um, that's okay. <laughs> you can take a baseline and benchmark approach and just um, make your budget, like we said, as a percentage of revenue and then monitor your metrics to make sure they're moving in the right direction. And um, you can work this way for a while and then you know make adjustments along the way as you need to. Um, what are some of these KPIs? So here's some examples. I've listed them here all the way through the buyer life cycle. So you might start with getting unique visitors to your website, page views, click throughs, maybe your search rank for certain keywords that are important to you. Um, uh, engagement um, would be return visits, interaction, maybe comments, maybe duration that they spent on your web website, or they take an action. This is like the holy grail is what you want them to do. Subscribe, consume content that you're doing, request more information, schedule a demo, ob obviously buy. Buy is a great one, that's what we want. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, even after they can become a customer, you're going to be continually wanting to market to them to get those good reviews, to get those testimonials, to get referrals. So um, these are things that you need to be looking at. Best practices. So we're finally to the part where um, we're going to talk about some of the things that you can do, and I'll try to give you some, some tips as well. Um, be agile. So speed and flexibility is a competitive advantage, particularly for people right now, and particularly if you're a smaller business. This could be a huge advantage for you. So um, digital marketing, you know, just fits perfectly into this. Um, it allows you to launch a campaign, test it, and adjust it on the fly with not a lot of investment. So um, you need some investment, but not a lot of investment. It's very different than the way traditional marketing worked and where you had to spend a lot of money, kind of figure out how to, you know, vet it with focus groups, do a big launch, then measure was it successful and then adjust. So it's a different process. It's much faster. Um, 
I did want to make the comment that speed also can be looked at at one other way. And that is that your customers tend to be impatient. So giving them answers fast is important. So if you put a chat bot on your website, you can be there when they have that question and actually answer it. So that could be with some canned responses or it could be, you know, a live chat bot. Um, live texting also can work this way as well. So speed to answer there. So if you're marketing via text, having live um, text queuing with um, your salespeople also can be a great way to um, uh, get a competitive advantage with speed. So automate where possible. So this is key for all marketing teams, but especially if you're going to be doing the work yourself in, in the beginning. So you want to um, schedule all your emails with marketing automation. So you can set up drip campaigns. So when somebody gets into your funnel, they're automatically put into a drip campaign and you don't have to touch it. That's your goal. You don't want to touch it. Social post scheduling, doing a bunch of them in advance. Um, that saves a lot of time. Uh, we talked about text marketing automation and chatbots already. Those are ways that you can semi-automate some of this. Uh, one of the new ones that I, that I really like is LinkedIn sales automation. So I'm using this myself. And um, basically what it does, it goes out and makes connections for me in my ideal customer profile. <laughs> um, and then once they connect with me, then, um, you know, I have an automated response to them. It doesn't sound automated. And if they respond, I then engage with them in a live conversation. So it's weeding out the people that actually want to engage and talk to me. And it actually works. So you want to think about some things like that. Um, social ads and search engine ads. I know that a lot of you are like, I don't want to spend a lot of money. You can set your budgets with these things. And that means, you know, you might limit some of the results of your campaigns, but you can set your budgets for these. So you want to think about doing some of these, looking into it. There are tons of firms that specialize in pay-per-click and social advertising that can help you with that. Um, reuse and repurpose. So if you are working on becoming a trusted authority in cybersecurity, and as I said, you're probably the one that is going to need to help create that content. It's going to take some time and some brain power. So you really want to leverage any assets that you have or that your vendor has created as much as possible. So um, an ebook, for example, could be turned into an entire webinar, or it could be a piece of it could be an infographic, or you could um, make a topic in the ebook or webinar into a blog. Uh, the blog can easily be turned into a video. There's software out there that can help you do that in, a, in an hour. So there's some things that you can do um, to leverage um, your content. The other thing I will say though, is that you need to promote, 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 promote your content. Social is a great way to promote your content. Email is a great way to promote your content. Um, you know, getting out there is really important, but you can repurpose your content. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Another thing I will add is refresh. So if you get to the point where you've got some popular content, add new information, add stats, add, update it. This is really great for SEO. So if you have a blog that's doing well or an ebook that's doing well, you know, refresh it, make it new. It improves your SEO rankings. It improves your downloads. You start to look like an expert and let people know that you refreshed it. Most of the blogs that I go to that have a lot of uh, statistical information, they've been there for years, but at the top they say, we updated this you know, last month so that your statistics here are current. There's no problem doing that. So it's a really a good strategy and you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, create multi-touch campaigns. So you probably heard about the rule of seven, that people need to hear something seven times before they remember it. <laughs> That's true in marketing and truth be told, it's probably a lot more than seven times. And um, when, uh, 
we were looking for some data. Actually, Susanna found this one. Um, HubSpot said 15 touch points <laughs> and over three marketing channels is necessary in order to get a conversion. Okay, so um, that's a lot of touching and you want to touch them a lot and you also want to try different channels and some of these examples that I gave you know I'm, I'm just walking through some potential paths to get a customer the first one in the blue is for somebody who doesn't really know you they've done an organic web search they get to your website they download your ebook you put them in an email drip um, through that, they find out about a webinar, they attend that, and then they're like, hey, you know, this looks good, I'm going to request a demo, and then hopefully you've wowed them and they become a customer. Uh, the second one is for somebody where you already have their information and you sent them a postcard. Remember, we talked about that it being a traditional marketing element, and it arrives and you send them an email right about the same time, day after, you, you call them, maybe you do a LinkedIn mail maybe a text if you're doing that. And then eventually you're, you know, you're going to get maybe a 15 minute meeting with them. You're gonna ask for that small commitment. And then they're gonna say, wow, you're everywhere. I've seen you everywhere. <laughs> That's a good thing. If they think that you're everywhere, then you're doing your job, okay? So. And Callie, can we, yeah, this is fine that you're, you went to the next slide, but just kind of, to reiterate what you're saying, like we live in a society where we want things really quick. Um, and it's so important in marketing that we don't quit after the first email goes out or, you know, we started a campaign. We didn't see much success. We have to keep nurturing those leads. Put them in your, you know, marketing. For sure. And platform yeah. and keep going at it. Because if you look at this chart, I mean, this is very typical, actually, of what I see with our leads. Um, by the time they fill out a form, and I can go back and look at the history, there are at least 12 touches, right? So we've sent them emails, they've attended webinars, um, maybe we saw them at an event. Uh, there's just so many different touch points before they actually are ready. And really, it's not our journey, it's their journey. So we have to be very cognizant of where they're at. And sometimes you know, they'll open the email, but they're not ready to buy. Actually, that's a lot of the time, right? But when they're ready, they'll remember you because you've done a good job. The other point that I make is that not all of these touch points they might see. Um, so, you know, like if you're trying different things, especially in the second example in red, Maybe they got the postcard, but you mailed it to their office and they're working from home, which is a problem, right? So they didn't get it. Or um, so that probably wouldn't have been a good strategy. But let's just say um, it's not COVID and they just happen to be a telecommuter and you didn't know that. Or um, you sent them an email and it went to their junk, okay? Sometimes you're going to have to try different things because you're not always going to get them on every try so being everywhere is really important because you're probably bound to run into them <laughs> that's why it's great to be you know a speaker um, get into other channels where um, that you don't own if you can be part of associations where you can be visible there you know there's lots of different ways that you can do this but you need to be you need to be visible and this needs to be part of your daily activity is doing all of these things. All right, so play the long game. So this is to Susanna's point. Prospects buy when they're ready to buy, not when we're ready to sell them. <laughs> we're ready right now, they're not ready. So what you're working towards is Mindshare. Mindshare is very important. Um, I love this uh, little stair step graphic from Microsoft. It talks through um, their study on the contacts that are required in order to get somebody to convert. And by contact seven, remember the role of seven, you're finally becoming top of mind for them, right? <laughs> contact seven, most people give up after two or three contacts thinking they're bugging somebody. Well, 
you know, maybe you are in some cases, but in a lot of cases, they're just not ready and they just need a little bit of time. And if you just keep calling them, contacting them, emailing them, eventually, you know, you're going to be the person that they remember. Um, by contact eight, Microsoft says that you may be the only one who's actually made eight contacts with this particular person. So um, by contact nine, if they're gonna buy, they're probably likely to call you. So that may not mean you're gonna win the business, but you'll at least get the opportunity to talk to them, submit a proposal, and you know that's really what you're you're searching for is that opportunity to get a proposal and hopefully win their business so anyway the last thing that i'm going to leave you with is be consistent so stick to your message because they need to hear it seven times or more <laughs> you need to keep saying the same things over and over and you're going to be sick of it but they may be hearing it for the first time, even though you've sent them seven different things or you've um, you know, worked with them seven different times, they're not going to necessarily digest it. So stick with your message, publish regularly, be on social daily. Um, also one thing about social, you can outsource this to an extent, but if you are not out there yourself, um, that's a problem because it, you really create those conversations and relationships and you need to actually spend some time. I recommend that you just do it every morning before you get into email and the crazy. Um, even if it's just 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you need to be out there every day commenting, posting, talking to your people. Um, if you can make it an hour, that would be better, but do what you can do. Um, schedule your outreach, re outreach, remember automate where you can, that will make your life much easier. Run your campaigns over time, multi-touch, and follow up, follow up, follow up as much as you can. So um, I wanted to also provide you with a few marketing resources. These are places that I go for information that I love. Um, a couple of them you might uh, really enjoy. I did add the Wiser Agency on there too, since he was part of this uh, series. Um, Chris does help a lot of MSPs with their marketing programs. Another one that I really like is Paul Green. He's from the UK, but he's also uh, very excellent. So if you're not following him, uh, you should be. Um, Sales Hacker, I know it's not about marketing, but I just love that site. So it's a, kind of like a community site. I would look into that. And then of course, there's a ton of uh, content marketing um, resources for you as well. And of course, I, you know, I'm always happy to help you. And, and um, my email is at the beginning of the presentation, but it's khenderson at buzztheory.com. I'm happy to talk to people um, if you have questions for me, of course. So, um, and right now, if we have time for questions, um, you know, I'm happy to. Okay, thank you, Callie. Uh, I, I was actually taking notes myself, even though I, um, I do marketing for my company because you're always, um, you always have new information that I um, I can use and apply. So thank you very much, Callie. I've opened all of your audio capabilities. Um, it defaults to mute, but we really want to take this time because this is a classroom setting. You know, we've created this um, space for you to ask Callie directly questions that you have. Uh, one person already <clears throat> asked if Callie could provide this. PowerPoint presentation for his marketing team, and absolutely, um, we will have this available for you uh, to review, to share with your team. Um, so let's, you know, let's go ahead and ask Callie questions that you may have if you need her to maybe repeat something that was unclear during the last uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, go ahead and unmute and ask away. I also I did add your email address to the chat <laughs> section. So um, if there are any yeah, so if you have a particular like um, specific problem that you're working right now and you want to chat with me about it, I'm super happy to do that offline. I know sometimes it's awkward to talk about specific things here. Um, 
I will say that one of the things that um, you might run up against, and you know, if you're the lead on your um, marketing efforts and you're the CEO or, or um, you know, in the C-suite, you might not have this problem as much, but sales and marketing alignment is a, is a big issue and where are the lines? Um, so really you need to stop thinking about sales and marketing as being two different groups. Um, we're both on the revenue team, uh, a term I just heard, uh, which I, I don't know how long it's been out, but I just heard it, was revenue marketer. And if you think about marketing as part of your revenue generation strategy, then that's thinking the right way. Um, it isn't just, you know, yeah, I'm going to make things look pretty. Yeah, you want to have a good brand, but it's, that's not it. You're trying to help get customers together and we're working together so one of the things that you can do if you're the sales lead is learn how to work with your marketing team and maybe it's you maybe you're both but um, if you're not make sure that you are working in lockstep with lockstep with them you know a lot about your customers you know what their pain points are share those with your marketers because they can create content to help you educate those customers to help you get over those objections that they might have to help move them through the cycle so that's one thing that i would recommend that you do um, obviously if you're the boss then you know it's coming from you and coming from the top and you can um, uh, make that happen you might be doing it yourself <laughs> but you know, definitely don't make marketing the enemy of sales because that's not it. You're both on the same team. Um, since you're attending this webinar, I'm guessing that you're more of the mind that marketing is important and, and that's great. I just, you know, would like for you to be set up for success and, and not go down that road where there are two separate teams that are, you know, have totally different goals because they don't marketers have revenue goals too so yeah very good point. i have a question yeah. my name is mark porter high wire networks nice to meet you <laughs> <laughs> hi mark <laughs> <laughs> thank you for, thank you for doing this for for us and our partners today um one of the things i know uh it took me about 17 years to figure out that marketing was actually important and i do not object to you amending uh my quote, I think that's absolutely, absolutely true. Um, I'm just curious in other organizations you work with or with other entrepreneurs uh, that you work with, we made a decision, as you know, we worked through our, our EOS process for running the business. Um, and we made a decision um, that even though the rest of my team reports up through my COO, um, I view marketing as really essential to the strategy of the organization is that is that something that you would typically see in mid-size and small smaller companies or um, is that an anomaly how where do you see marketing fitting in the hierarchy of, of an executive team yeah so the more the bigger they are the more likely they are to have marketing at the table um, but that's not always true um, there are a few companies that have been built solely by sales and they don't, um, they don't appreciate the value of marketing. And here's what I would say to that is that, yeah, you have been successful solely on sales, but think about how much more successful you could have been if you actually did marketing or, you know, so it isn't an either or type thing, you need to do them both in lockstep. So I do think it's harder for smaller companies, particularly the ones, you know, and I don't like to be stereotypical, but I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> if you're a tech company, you're probably in a smaller one, you probably were founded by a tech person, right? Somebody who was just really good at tech. And um, that's great, but 
the comfort and the expertise isn't going to be in the sales and marketing. You're sort of forced into the sales part because you have to get revenue. And um, the marketing part really uh, isn't a priority for you. But today, if you're not marketing, you're not going to be able to fill your funnel. So um, if you are only relying on referrals, which referrals are great, so I don't want to poo-poo referrals, but if you're only relying on your network um, just to feed you leads and you're not creating a pipeline, then it isn't a predictable um, it isn't a predictable thing. So let's just say um, a pandemic hits <laughs> and you know a bunch of your clients um, cancel on you. Um, you know, maybe or they something happens, they go out of business, whatever. How are you gonna replace that revenue if you don't have a pipeline? You know, uh, it's just something that you need to always be doing in order to create some predictability in your revenue. So um I, I think Kelly, that's really essential. And I, I one of the things I'm passionate about is helping other entrepreneurs, sometimes our partners, sometimes not. And sometimes uh, I, I work with um, a group at the local high school that uh, has an incubator for uh, teenagers and they teaches them entrepreneurship. But I think it's really essential that a lot of people learn to understand how far through the customer journey that an end user really gets before they even begin to talk to somebody they're 65 to 75% of the way through that journey and you've been down selected before you've been called. So the good news is your at bats should be much higher quality at bats than 15 years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, but the bad news is you're probably not getting nearly as many of them if you're not creating presence and generating interest way, way before you know that person exists. The, the signal intelligence, so to speak, has to be very, very strong to get them even close to wanting to talk to you. For sure. I mean, just think about what you do in your personal life. I mean, the last time you bought a car, did you even go to the car dealership? You probably were online forever. You found the car you wanted, you figured out what you, all the things you wanted in it, and then you shopped to find it, what dealer you were going to use. I mean, you know, and you do that with everything. People are no different with their business decisions. They do that. They're people. This is how they buy now. They're going on, they're finding out, hey, I have this problem. What is the solution to it? Oh, okay. There's a bunch of solutions. Oh, who are the vendors? okay, I'm looking at the vendors and I go to all their websites or I attend their webinars or I read their materials and, uh, or I go to comparison sites or what I'm doing all my research there. If you're not there, they're not even looking at you. <laughs> they're not even looking at you. So, you know, that's, it's a problem, you know, and, and, you know, there's lots of ways to solve it. Like we've been talking about, but you got to do it. So. Coming to that realization, uh, and, and I was fortunate enough uh, before we met you to have somebody educate me and help me understand that concept, and that was the light bulb moment for me uh, as to why we needed to market and why our website was way more important for different purposes than I ever really had thought about it before. I, I, so I just wanted to share that moment because for me that was the aha moment about why we needed to do it and why I needed to spend money in this thing that I could not initially at least directly correlate my ROI where sales was a very linear thing. I pay them X, they yes. return Y and I, you are either succeeding or you are failing. So you can either continue to work here or we bid adieu, right? So marketing was not like that. And as an entrepreneur, um, I thought I understood it. Uh, but what I came to realize is that I, I didn't understand the damn thing about it. And, and uh, so I hope if that shares uh, uh, any, sheds any light for anybody, I hope that's beneficial. I also plug in for our partners. Um, next year, uh, you'll start to see that we're going to be working very diligently with Cali and with some other resources that we have in-house because uh, 
Uh, we have a bunch of resources in-house. Cali is essentially our uh, consigliere, if you will, and, and uh, come off the terms, uh, mentoring us all on our journey and helping us with uh, making sure our messaging is consistent and giving an outside view so that when we uh, sometimes uh, live in our own echo chambers and, uh, and get fall in love with our own ideas, Kelly can help others explain why I'm always wrong. Um, <laughs> it's easier for her sometimes, uh, but in, in, um, in the future, uh, next year, and we'll have some announcements about this in the first quarter, we're gonna be looking to put together packages for our partners and, and leverage off of the things that we've done and the uh, expense and, and investment that we've made to try to help our partners accelerate their marketing journey and, and uh, uh, work with us to not just sell more security and, and more of our Overwatch platform, but to improve your own business. Excellent. And and by the way, you know we were trying to talk a little bit about marketing cybersecurity today, but all of these things obviously work for any of the services that you're selling. So if cybersecurity is just one of them you know, all of the services that you're selling can uh, be sold and marketed this way. So it's just a good practice. And, you know, you'll, it takes some time to get going, but um, you got to start. And I would say, you know, if you're not doing it, start now. Okay. Well, guys, it's 10.01 and I don't want to take more of your time and respect that you guys all probably have a busy schedule today. So thank you for all of you who attended. Again, take the certification exam for CPE credit on the partner portal. If you are not our partner and want to know more about what we offer, go to our website, highwirenetworks.com slash overwatch. And remember, if you want to continue this conversation, we're on social, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, find us. We would love to chat with you guys, answer any of your questions, and uh, just, like I said, be part of you know, a, a greater community. And that involves you and us together. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Callie. We'll catch up later. Bye. Bye.